Okay, before I get too into it, I'm going to make a quick hack here that might actually solve a lot of this draw problem. And I might not have to go too in depth on doing other stuff. So uh, instead of drawing the display every single instruction, I'm going to only draw the display once the uh, display functions are called. So only if something happens here will I actually draw something to the display. I think that's probably a reasonable way to do it. So I'll call draw display from here, and then I don't have to call it from my main loop, which is way faster. Yeah, that looks relatively decent. And then what I could do, just to make it sit up there a little bit longer, is once we do draw the display, I could do my thread sleep here. Let's say 16 milliseconds or something. We can go 20 milliseconds. Right, so that way we're actually letting it sit there on the screen for a little bit. That looks a bit better. Now what would be interesting to see is if there are any like CPU stress tests that I can run through this because I don't know what instructions are being run or not being tested and so forth. And I mean, to be honest, I don't even know if this is rendering quite as it's supposed to. It looks pretty good to me, but I think we're gonna need to try a few other games and things to make sure this works properly. Um, another way to make this draw display work a bit better is to actually have it right to the console at the position where it's actually changing something. So I'll try that really quick here too because that sounds like a cool thing to hack on. So instead of calling draw, draw display here, what I'll do is I'll do it in here. So if pixel, yeah, that's going to set to 15. That looks good. So if display index does not equal best way to do this. If display index equals one and pixel equals one, then we have to go and set it back to zero, else we're going to go and set it to one. Okay. So here what we'll do is we'll go and say console dot set cursor position and we'll set it to X and Y. Let me make sure I do this right. X plus J and Y plus I. And then console.write. And then this one we're going to be clearing. So I'll put a space in there. Other else if display index equals 0 and pixel equals 1. we're going to be setting that to a star. Let's just see if this works. So I'm not calling draw display all. Now it's very fast. Okay, so I think what we have to do is after this, we'll do a thread.sleep, say 20 milliseconds. And then we'll only do it if it's dirty. So display dirty, false. Display is dirty, then we'll go and thread sleep 20 because we did some writing to the screen. Let's see how that looks. I'm pretty happy with that. This won't look as good for other programs. This is kind of a hack right now because we're drawing this in the console. Uh, the real way to do this at the end of the day will be to write this to some sort of bitmap and then render it to the screen using something like uh, SDL or some other way, blitting it to the screen. But I just wanted to have a quick way to draw some pixels and since we're already in the console app, uh, this looked like a pretty good way to do it. So uh, with that kind of running, I think I'm gonna take a break for the night and we'll come back to it another day and in another video. So thanks for watching my series so far. I'm building this chip aid emulator and hopefully we can wrap it up in the next session. Chat soon. All right, hello everyone. It's a new day and we're gonna continue with the project of making this chip aid interpreter thing. 
So uh, this is as far as we got yesterday. It looks like the, uh, the Heartbeat program was working pretty well. Let me just load it back up again to show where we left off. So this is, this is actually looking pretty reasonable. And just for fun, uh, last night before I actually went to sleep, I took a look to see what type of opcodes this was running. And we actually are running quite a few of the opcodes within this interpreter. For example, we are doing all the subroutine calling, so I can see it happening here, as well as uh, pushing onto the stack, the program counter. So a lot of the stuff that I was uh, worried might not be getting called, that might have a lot of bugs in it, seems to be getting called it seems to be working relatively well and then what I did was I went online to try to find some more chip 8 games and I found this domain called zofar.net and they've got a ton of information about different emulators and include uh, some chip 8 games and so I downloaded those and uh, I'm gonna give those a try next so let's see what happens so this is a missile game and uh, we can see it drawing what looks to be a relatively decent screen here, but nothing's happening. And uh, I, have a, I have an idea of why nothing is happening. I'm guessing that this is using some of the timers that we haven't implemented yet. So I'd like to take a few minutes to implement those super quick. So the idea here is that uh, there's a sound timer and a delay timer, and both of those decrement at a rate of 60 times per second. We can see that in the documentation uh, here, I think. Timers and sound. So they subtract one from it at a rate of 60 hertz, and so we need to go and um, time the time, I guess, between each of these calls to step, and every time it goes over 16 or so milliseconds, 17 milliseconds, we'll decrement both of those. And so to do that, I'm going to use the uh, stopwatch class, which is part of system diagnostics. And then what we can do here is, at the start of my step, if that watch is not running, and we'll start it. And then if the elapsed milliseconds of that is more than, let's call it 16, it's actually 16.6666666, but uh, 16 is probably close enough. If the delay timer is greater than zero, then subtract one from the delay timer. If the sound timer is greater than zero, then subtract one from that. And then we have to restart our watch. So now that we've implemented these timers, let's see if things work a little bit better. This is looking reasonable. Something's going on now. That's pretty cool. Now I don't have any keyboard input, so I can't actually do anything yet, but let's try a couple other games. Uh, what options do we have here? We've got Tetris. Tetris, let's try Tetris. That's pretty cool. So that's a Tetris block drop, and let's see if it hits the bottom and collides properly. Oh, index out of range, okay. So I think I have to protect against this index value being too large, probably because I have this wraparound stuff. Uh, if index is greater than 2047, then just ignore it. I think we have to do that right before that call. Try that out. Looks like it's generating random blocks too, so it looks like the random number generator is kind of working. Alright, this is looking pretty reasonable. Nice, that dropped in just as it should have. So it looks like Tetris is kind of working. If I had keyboard input, we could actually play it, but we don't have that quite yet. Let's see, we'll try try one or two other games. How about some Pong? Pong 2, Pong 2 sounds like it's a better version. Cool, looks like it drew it and the ball's moving around and because I have no keyboard input, I've lost. Cool, that's looking pretty reasonable. Let's see if I can speed it up a little bit. I think I've still got a red sleep in here. Let's just try knocking that out for now. 
Oh, that's way too fast. Okay, let's, we'll leave that in there. Okay, well now that this is all implemented, I think that the next step is probably to get user input going on. I can't decide if I want to do user input first or if I want to uh, actually render this to screen using something like SDL. Looks like I got a lucky uh, first pass there in Pong, so it just keeps on going. I wonder if it will ever... Uh, no, it looks like it's just going to keep on going. Cool. Well, this is one way to get a high score at Pong, I guess. One other thing I could do actually before I start working on AV and put stuff or getting this displaying in a window is to uh, include the built-in font. So let me give that a try really quick. I think that's going to be part of the load program here. And I will initialize the font. And it looks like this font, I'm storing it at uh, memory location zero. And we've got 16 five byte characters to store. So I'm just gonna put each of those in to the RAM after it's been initialized. So I'm just gonna kind of read through these hex values and drop them into the RAM. Uh, I wonder if, I think I might even try to make this easier on myself by saying something like byte characters and just including each of these things like that and I'm going to cheat a little bit by using notepad here and just doing some simple find and replace so let's try this out I'm going to take character 0 one, two, three, and so on. Bear with me. We'll get there eventually. Eight, nine, ten, which is A in hexadecimal. B, D, oh sorry, C, <laughs> D, E, and then finally F, and then what we'll do is we'll replace all new lines with a comma, and that way we can go and take all of these and drop them in as a byte array. And then, I think there's an array, way to copy an array to another array. So, let's try that out. The source array is characters, the destination array is RAM, and the length would be characters.length. And let's just try that out, see if this kind of looks right. So my RAM should contain that looks pretty reasonable. Uh, F0, 90, 90, 90, F0, 20, so on and so forth. And it should be the first 16 times 5 entry. 16 times 5 is 80. So that looks pretty good. Awesome. So I think we've got the built in font loaded now. All right. So I think the next step is going to be uh, getting SDL downloaded and uh, opening a window that way. And then we'll copy this display somehow into a texture or an image and use SDL to display that. And then we'll use SDL to do uh, our input handling so that we can actually play these games. And so that's what we'll take a look at in the next video. And until then, have fun programming.